that? In the bathroom? That's awkward. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, um, we are going to be talking talking about something that's very near and dear to my heart. <sighs> this is the I, I before we get going, I do want to kind of give a little bit of a um, disclosure. This is not going to be a complete lesson. We're going to have to come back to some things about this in future lessons. Um, we're not going to talk about the purpose of the law. Okay, Leviticus. Not, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about um, the priesthood and that kind of stuff. Um, this is going to be very limited, and I'm going to try very hard to just keep it on that limited focus, okay? So, what is the purpose of the church? To make disciples? Yes. Yes. Very good. Anybody want to add anything to that? Uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, um, and, I'm sorry, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then we flip over to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and... Um, <laughs> Little Bibles. This is why I don't like little Bibles. Um, right here. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all, Ju um, all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Obviously, what he's talking about here is not having powers and superhuman power. He's talking about power to do God's will. So, um, the the main purpose, the main point in all this is is the um, is the actual you know, uh, making disciples. Did that sprite help any? Yes. Okay, well, there's more if you need any. Okay. Um, so then where did the church come from? I mean, we have the Christianity now, and we have kind of Jews over there, you know, but where did the church come from? What happened? You guys are real talkative tonight. It started in Acts, right? Yeah, yeah. Where, where, did it, where did it come from? Just they got together and started. But I mean, who got together though? The Christians. The disciples. Okay. The, the, the eleven. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to reword this anymore. Ah, I'm Holy trying to. Spirit. The Satanists. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll just go ahead and answer this one, and we'll go to the next question, okay? Um, Christianity came from Judaism. Oh, yeah. It, it came from the Jews. Jesus was Jewish, and the, ele the, the well, technically the twelve, but um, the eleven were Jewish. And, and the early church, for all intents and purposes, was Jewish. In fact, they were referred to as Jews. So, um, let's kind of kind of build on that, because that kind of ma makes it sound like I'm saying that we are currently Jews, so let's plow ahead. Um, what did the early church consider themselves to be? What, what did they call themselves? Because Christian was a name that was given to them 100 years later. So what did they call themselves? Followers of Jesus? Okay. Okay. This year's the not really the answer I was going for, but I mean, I mean, I <laughs> guess it's. Just your summit. Oh, okay. Because you know they would do the fish thing to show Derek. Well, that was kind of a little bit later again, but. Oh. Okay. Um, I mean, no, I'm I'm not trying to make you make you feel dumb, right? I, I just said that wrong. Uh, I'll just go ahead and thought. Uh, children of God. They called themselves children of God. They called themselves exactly what the Jews called themselves. You know. Um, which is what caused a lot of the tension between the Christians and the Jews, was because the Jews were trying to get the Christians to conform to the law, and the <coughs> Christians were saying that they didn't need to conform to the law. See, so you had this tension. Well, the Old Testament says this, and they both read the same Bible, the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi. 
They read the exact same Bible. Mm -hmm. And so you had the Jews on one side saying, you guys aren't following the law, whereas you had the Christians on the other side saying, Jesus was the fulfillment of that law. So you had this just this real tension. And it wasn't until uh, quite a while afterwards that the division came between the Christians and the Jews. Um, in fact, the early Christian church had a lot of Jews in it. Um, from what it sounds like, a large majority of the uh, um, of the 3,000 that were saved in Jerusalem on that, that day of Pentecost, it sounds like a large majority of them were Jews. It sounds like it, at least from what he's saying there. Uh, I could be wrong there, but... Um, and, uh, uh, in fact, so the church was started in the 30s A.D., and it wasn't until sometime around the 60s that a real division began, and the Romans didn't really see a division until about 100 A.D. So you can see it kind of took a while before... See, I mean, uh, people kind of just saw it as a sect within Judaism. So, um, once we understand kind of where we came from, it's easier to understand um, how Judaism is now considered a... So why did Jesus uh, come? To seek and save the Blam! Whoa! Blam! <laughs> Blam! Exactly. That is exactly why Jesus came. He came to set people free. He came for that purpose. Um, apart from which, that wouldn't have happened. Now... We're going to get into this a little bit later, but the Jews kind of got this idea of Jewish superiority. Okay? Kind of like, we've been given the law, we are God's chosen, everybody else can go to hell. Oh my gosh. That's actually why they were looking for the Messiah, was so that he could set up his government and, uh, and annihilate the rest of the, of the nations, that you know, the Jews would once again be free. So, um, obviously, that's why when P Peter says that, Jesus says, you know, you don't have... You don't have God's kingdom on your heart right now. This is you're wrong here, Peter, because Peter's talking about this earthly thing going on, and Jesus is talking about this whole big spiritual thing that like is so much bigger than Peter's understanding, you know. Um, so, was Jesus planned all along? Now, this is something that um, you don't have to answer. This this is this is something that we're going to be looking at. Okay. No. So let's start with Genesis three fifteen. <laughs> um. I, I hope most of you know the story, but okay, so God creates everything um, in, in the seven days, and then, um, well, technically six, but not really important, um, and then eventually um, Adam and Eve sin, and so God, you know, punishes them and kicks them out of the Garden of Eden, and this is something that um, that God says to, um, between the woman and, uh, and, and, the, and the serpent, okay, it's in 315, it says, and I will put en enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and the, and you shall bruise him on on the hill. Now, obviously, what this is talking about, and I don't really have time to get too much into this, is he's talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, if you know the the Christmas song, um, "Bruise and as the serpent's head," and he's all talking about that whole that whole line is talking about this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So basically, what he's saying is, is you know, there's always going to be this this um, this tension that, that's going on within us, but in the end, uh, man is going to win. How? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to win over the serpent, and that's what he's talking about here. But anyways, and so we see um, Jesus being prophesied about as early as Genesis 3:15. Um, I mean, obviously that's that's pretty substantial. But then we go down to 9:27, and it and we start looking at something that I um, actually overlooked. It's to the scholarly work of not Craig Keener, Kaiser, a, 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 a very, very good scholar by the name of Kaiser, which I don't agree with him on a lot of different things, but on this I think he's spot on. Um, in, in the story, um, after um, they get off the ark, um, uh, there's this little prophecy given. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his um, brothers. But then he says down here, He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now it says here, let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Um, 
some people have assumed that he's saying, let Japheth live in the tents of Shem, but that doesn't make sense. It makes a lot more sense if it's um, if it's actually carrying over, let him, God, dwell in the tents of Shem. Because who did Shem eventually give birth to? Abraham. Who gave birth to Israel, right? So it makes more sense if he's talking about God dwelling in the tents of Shem, because he did dwell in the tents of Shem. See what I mean? So once again, um, your different translations will say di different things here. That's because the way that the Hebrew sentence is there is kind of a little bit difficult. It could go either or. Um, by comparing it with the rest of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we can know that it's God. But if you just kind of take it by itself, it's ambiguous as to whether it's God or Japheth. So there we are, and we have the second notice of God making a, making a chosen people. So he mentioned Jesus in 315. He mentioned um, setting aside a people in 927. That takes us down to chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, oh, and by the way, if you want any more uh, in-depth stuff on that 920, passage 927, um, it's called the Promise Plan, um, which is where I got the name for the tonight's lesson, uh, the Promise Plan of Something by Kaiser. Uh, what was his name? Walter Kaiser is his name, and the book is called The Promised Plan. Oh, I can't remember the last part. But if you look at The Promised Plan, Walter Kaiser, you'll find it. Um, now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. Now, we assume he's talking about Israel, but he's not talking about Israel. Watch this. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse you. I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. See, he's not talking about just Israel. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Well, how are all the families blessed? Through Jesus. Uh, Paul is going to talk about this in Galatians. Um, then Genesis 15, 17. So we see continually this theme coming up and coming up and coming up again about um, God raising up a people. Now, I know this is, might seem a little bit dry, but this is an, an extremely important for why Judaism um, is now a cult. Okay? Um, Genesis 15, 17. It came about when the sun had set, um, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. Now, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but throughout the chapter, God basically says, you know, I'm going to do this great thing for you. And he says, how do I know? What's the sign here? And he says, okay, I want you to take these animals, cut them in half, and put them, you know, there. Okay, so he does this. Excuse me. And then um, after this, kind of this whole thing happens, and God tells him a few different things. Nighttime comes, and and and, and uh, a torch, and what was the other thing? Um, a flaming torch and a smoking oven pass between um, the corpses. And I mean, this might not mean anything to us nowadays, but to Abram then, basically, God is promising by Himself that if He does not fulfill the promise, that may it be unto him as it was unto the unto the dead animals. See I mean? So he's kind of promising by himself that he's going to do this thing. That's why in Hebrews it says, since he couldn't promise by anything better, he promised by himself. He promised by himself. See? Um, and then so that takes us down to Genesis seventeen five, where um, God changes a a Abraham, Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. Um, no longer shall your name be called Abram, which means exalted father, but your name shall um, excuse me, but your name shall be called Abraham. Um, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. See, already God's talking about the inclusion of people. He just used one family to do so. See, that doesn't mean that Israel was always his only plan. So then, hopping all the way down to Galatians. Paul, picking up on this, um, uh, starts talking about the seed. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but, refer, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law... It is no longer based on a promise. Did you hear that? Let me read that part again. This is actually very important. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. What existed before? 
God's promise to Abraham or God's law to Israel? His promise. The promise. And what endured after the law? The, the promise. promise. What still endures to today? The promise. See? The law was something that was added after the promise. Okay? That, that needs to be established because... The law was not the finished product. Sometimes we get in our heads, you know, the law, that was kind of the climax of what God was saying, and then everything else is just, you know, well, no, it's the promise was the main thing, and then the law was just kind of a, I want to say, not a substitution, but um, an addition to the promise, kind of like a clarification. Once again, though, we're not really going to get into the into the law tonight. Um, <clears throat> so, did the works of the law ever save those who practiced them? Are you saying no, or are we just scratching? I don't know. Oh. I'm, I'm thinking. Did the works of the law ever save Israel? I want to say no. Okay. Why do you want to say no? Because it's about the heart. Okay. Um, do you have anywhere to point us to? Okay, no, that's okay. I was just asking. Anybody else? Or did you have anything else to say? Okay. The short answer is no. In Romans 9, 30 through 32, Paul says, and I quote, <laughs> What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith, but Israel, now pay attention to this part, but Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. Mm -hmm. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, and then he goes on to talking talk about the predestination and whatnot. Um, you see what he just said there? They thought the law was saving them. Their faith wasn't in God. It was in the law. So when the fulfillment of the law came, who was Jesus? Obviously, they, they missed it, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and I encourage you to write that passage down and read it over again a couple times. 9, 30 through 32. Really, chapters 9 through 11 give a lot of insight into the whole Israel's place now, Israel's place back then, the whole thing. Just really great insight. People usually avoid chapters 9 through 11 because they kind of are afraid of the whole predestination thing. They're just kind of like, I don't understand it. Ah! You know, we'll talk about predestination eventually, probably. Um, so was Israel supposed to have a king then? No. No? Okay. All right. What makes you guys think that? Well, it's in the Bible, which you have in mind, so I can't look it up. When they asked for Saul to be their king, or when they asked for a king... He told them that they could have Saul, but he was supposed to be their king. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. Along with the king, help him find his donkeys. <laughs> with that being said, how big of a doofus does it make King Saul out to be? He is out there, donkeys. Where'd you go, donkeys? <laughs> yes, that's the guy I went to lead. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, do you want me to say where? Go ahead, yes, read whatever you want. Uh, so Hosea 8. Okay. Uh, it says, they have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, prince, um, but I did not know it. You okay. Keep reading? No, I that's fine. If, are you done reading? Or? Yeah, I am. Okay. Oh, well, um, 1311. So they have 1311? I have it. Oh. Give me a king and prince. I gave you king of my anger and took him away in my wrath. Okay. No, I had that. You're proud of that one, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> the look on her face is priceless. She's like, victory! <laughs> Huzzah! Right, very good. Anybody else want to say anything? 
Very good, very good. Um, we're going to turn to Deuteronomy 17, or if you're not turning, then I'll turn. 17, 14 through 20. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you, uh, whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren, you shall set as king over you. you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself. And he goes on to the different things there. And then if you go down to Judges um, 21, 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Um, let me just stop right here. Um, one of the things that I find astounding about the Old Testament is never really clarifies whether a king was planned by God or not. It tells us that in 1 Samuel that that was not God's timing and that was their own thing of rebellion. That was not something that God called and said, it is now time for you. But it doesn't say if they never were supposed to have a king or not. Very weird. Deuteronomy mentions, you know, when you get a king, looking forward, knowing that eventually it's going to happen, but that doesn't mean that God was okay with it, nor does it mean that God was not okay with it. And Judges, if you read through Judges, one of the focal points is that there was no righteous leader. You see a constant decay and immorality set in until finally there's just chaos. <laughs> I mean, chaos. People are getting cut up and sent to different places. It's just chaos. It's just bad news happening. you know. And it ends with that line. There was no king. Everyone was doing just whatever, whatever you know, they felt was right in their own heart. You know what I mean? And it says that I think three or four different times in the book. It's kind of a main point of the story is that there was no real spiritual leader. You know, um, Judges points forward to a Messiah more than a lot of the other Old Testament books. Just constantly looking for, you know, looking at the way things are immoral. Leaders fell. We need something more righteous. You know, always looking for this thing, but Judges never gives us the clarity as to who this person is. See what I mean? Um, and then for Samuel is what Chuck was mentioning. Um, Israel comes to comes to Saul, who is the last um, judge of Israel, and says, you know, we want a king because everybody else is doing it, and, I mean, we don't want to be the kids that are picked on, okay? And uh, so Saul says, I, please don't do this. And they're like, no, we want a king. And so he goes to God, and God's like, they're not, re they're not, they're not um, rebelling against you. They're rebelling against me. And I think that's very important because it's important to note that regardless of whether Israel was supposed to get a king or not, At they did it wrong then. They weren't supposed to. Yeah. yeah. Either they did it with the wrong heart or the wrong time. Whatever it is, they did it wrong. And... It was rebellion. They were rebelling against God. Now that's very important um, in in the story here. Um, yeah. So, but then they do get a king, which takes us to this question. So, was the king part of the promise? Was the king part of the promise? I mean, I don't remember him being mentioned in any of those promises. Do you? See what I mean? It kind of kind of makes you wonder. But then we get down to Second Samuel. <clears throat> now I want I want before I say this, God's promise never failed and it never changed. Rather, in throughout the course of history, God enriched it in different ways, through the law, through the prophets, through the kingdom. But He never it, it was never done away with. He just enriched it in different ways. Okay. I want to establish that difference. Now, now I will read Saint Samuel chapter seven, fifteen through sixteen. Fifteen. Five. I'm sorry, five through sixteen. Uh, go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? I'm sorry. Let me set up the story. Um, so David's like, you know what, I think I'm going to build a temple for God because I have this really nice house, and he kind of just has this, you know, shanty little shack out there, okay? So, um, he goes to Nathan, who's a prophet, and he says, I'm going to do this, cool? And Nathan's like, yeah, sure, go for it. But then when Nathan leaves, God tells Nathan to go back and tell him not to build it, and this is what he tells him. 
Um, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time I, um, that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Now let me stop here for a brief second and say, the temple was never necessarily, I can't really get too much into this, wasn't really God's focal point, and it's questionable as to whether it was even God's idea more like something they just allowed them to do. So don't get too hot and heavy about um, the Israelite temple. Okay, well, all, that's all I'm going to say on that tonight. We'll probably come back to that in the future. But. Um, Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, um, sheepfold from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over um, Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men um, who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a, pl a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Now, if you guys know the book of Acts, Stephen talks about this, or Stephen, Stephen, uh, talks about this being uh, fulfilled in the and how we're going to inherit the earth. Okay, read through Acts seven, I believe, is where he, is where, he, and he's talking about these different things. Um, <clears throat> since that time uh, that I commanded judges uh, to be over my people Israel, and I've caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that He will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Okay, so he's talking about some, a kingdom, and a place that never, that never, will, they'll never be kicked out of, the new heavens and the new earth, right? And he's talking about a, a, a establishing a kingdom. Now, watch what he says here. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who built a house for Jesus' name? Now, we all think he's talking about Solomon. But wasn't it actually Jesus who actually built the house for God's name? Wasn't that? See what I mean? Yeah. So uh, there's kind of the, now this is called foreshadowing, and we'll look at this in just a second. Um, and is Jesus' kingdom forever? Yes. See, Israel thought it was about immediate physical things, and God was talking about much deeper spiritual promises. Mm -hmm. I'll be His father, and He shall be my son. What is Jesus called? The Son of God, <coughs> right? Um, if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of his sons of men. Now watch how he switches back and forth between talking about some things that apply to both Solomon and Jesus, something that only some things that only apply to Jesus, and some things that only apply to Solomon. See how that kind of he kind of switches through there? Very interesting how he does this. Um, but my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I have re removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, and according to the, all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. See, oftentimes God gives a vision, but it's not, or a prophecy or promise or whatever, but it's not fulfilled for a long time. <coughs> God gave Abram this promise, but he only saw very partial fulfillment through his son Isaac. Very partial. He didn't even see Israel, the, the who had the, the twelve sons. You know, the twelve sons of Israel. He he never even saw that. So I mean, so this so this is kind of. Sometimes God ha takes his time to do things. Um, okay. And God's promise never changed. I already mentioned that. So, um, Did Israel's failure affect God's promise at all in history? Why or why not? Just to give you an example, you know, when Israel was in the wilderness and they failed, you know, and God, you know, had to punish them for different things. Um when they came to him with uh, asking for a king all you know when when they failed did Israel's failure affect God's promises at all why or why not I think yes okay how so or why or why not uh, because there there was consequences mm -hmm. for certain actions that they had done okay like, uh, when they rebelled, then the one generation couldn't enter the promised land. They had to die out in the wilderness. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anybody else? I think yes and no. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, because it switched to different people. No, because the promise remained. Uh huh. So you're really saying then, no, it didn't affect the promise, just that there are people who are punished. Or, because you just said the promise still remained, right? Right, the promise still remained, it just, it just switched to different people, I think. Like, a, a lot of people then get to see it happen. Other people see it. Okay, all right. You know, like what Chuck was saying, it went to a different generation. Okay. This is easier to understand if I put it in a modern context. You who are saved, let's assume that, I don't know, I'm not going to make any judgment calls, let's just say all of you are saved. Okay. Um, if you decide to abandon your faith, will that affect God's promise for those who will accept? No? That's exactly the answer to this. Okay. The promise was never altered. However, the people and their response to it was changed. For instance, like what Chuck mentioned, they were still punished and held accountable for it. As, as Gracie mentioned, some people missed out on it. The same as people nowadays miss out when they reject. However, the promise never failed. Because – now this is increasingly important. Why it is important to say that, that God's promises uh, pr were, were, are uh, never failed past Israel's failure, okay? is because the promises were dependent on God's character and not on Abraham or his son's ability. Remember back to the promise? Who walked between the animals? See what I mean? God. That's why it's important to make this distinction. I know it seems like a minor distinction, but as you go throughout the history, it actually is a pretty big deal. God's promise remained past Israel's failure. Because God had bigger things, okay, than just Israel. Okay, so all that happened was people missed out on the promise, but God's promise remained. In fact, if you remember one part, God specifically says to Moses, I'm just going to kill them and I'll use you. Because Moses was from Abraham, and so the promise was still going to be fulfilled. And Moses pleaded the case for mercy, see what I mean? Now, God didn't have to spare those people. He could have raised them up for Moses, okay? But once again, God knew it was going to happen, so he didn't have to make the promise in the first place. So it's kind of hard to keep up with all this because it gets very confusing when you're going back and forth throughout history because we see things in a historical kind of way, you know what I mean? But God, he sees everything at the same time, and he knows what's happening, what is happening, what will happen, what, ha what has happened, see what I mean? And so when he makes a promise, he says, this is what's going to happen, see what I mean? And we just don't see things the same, see what I mean? I guess what I'm trying to say is our thinking is more linear. Is that a good way to say that? I don't, I don't know. Um, um, but okay. So what theme then does the Old T Testament hinge on? <coughs> Genesis to Deuteronomy. And the promises recorded there. That's the theme of the Old Testament. Read through the prophets. What are they always talking back to? The, the law of Moses. They're always talking back to that. The, 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 if you read through how many times they talk about Abraham and the promise, see what I mean? Read through how many times that thing, that thing goes through. Everything in the Old Testament pivots on Genesis through Deuteronomy. That's the core of the Old Testament, if you will. Um, and so how, the, old, how the, the, the Genesis through Deuteronomy begins is with that promise and it ends with that law. See, and then it takes us to the books of history where it's talking about the king and it expands on those things and how – notice, read through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. And notice how the main point is how well those kings obeyed the laws as recorded in Genesis through Deuteronomy. See what I mean? That's their whole focus. It is, they don't even care how successful the king was as long as, well as, as, long as he was um, spiritually successful. See what I mean? That's what everything even pivots on. Then we get to the, to the prophets. And they're always talking back to the righteousness of the Lord. Uh, those people who meditate on your perfect law, law, O oh God. And they're always talking back to that. That's the pivoting focal point. Um, so then that takes us to what is, the, what is the heart of God's kingdom then? Jesus is always talking about God's kingdom. You know, and the prophets is always, are always talking about every The whole Bible is always talking about God's kingdom. So what is the heart of God's kingdom? 
restoring people to relationship with him. From the very beginning, we see God wanting to restore people to relationship with himself. All the way back from Genesis, he makes them where they're in fellowship with him already. They didn't have to be to do anything. They were they were walking with God. Then they sinned, and as soon as they sinned, God's already giving them a promise of a future deliverance. See what I mean? As soon as they sinned, and God knew that they were going to do it too. Um, you know, and then throughout all the all Genesis through Deuteronomy, we see God's promises. And what is it? How, does, near the end of Deuteronomy, what does he say? Choose life. I'm setting before you life and death. Choose life that you may live. This is what I want for you. I'm giving you the way of life. All you have to do is obey. That's it. See what I mean? You just hear God's constant pleading throughout the Old Testament. But Malachi ends. Okay, so does everybody know what happens after after the Babylonian captivity? Does anybody know what happens after that in the Old Testament? No, no. Do you? No? Ben, do you know what happens after the Babylonian captivity? No. Nobody knows? You know, you were in the New Testament class. Okay. Well, okay. So after the Babylonian captivity, they take them. Persia comes and conquers, and they take them back and put them back in Israel, right? Okay. But if you'll remember that, they're able to set up their thing. They're able to rebuild Jerusalem. What are they still lacking? They've got the people back. They've got the land back. The perfect ruler. They're still waiting for that perfect ruler. How does how does Jesus how does Matthew start up with the genealogy of Jesus? See, immediately picks right back up where the 400 years of silence or 200 years I can't remember now 400, 400 years of silence left off at. See what I mean? Immediately picks back up. Um, obviously pointing towards the Christ, the thing that the thing that was so needed, which leads me into thinking that it's probable that God intended at least at some point to do something with a leader in Israel because God has a way of foreshadowing something that's, that hasn't happened yet. You know what I mean? Like he gives the people the sanctuary to show them what it's going to be like when they're saved. You know, he, he gives them the land of Israel so that they'll know what it's like in the new heavens and the new earth. So, I mean, he keeps doing these things to foreshadow the future coming goodness, but, but apart from establishing a key, King over Israel, there really wasn't that much to establish godly leader over Israel. I mean, there were the judges, I guess, so kind of, but kind of, kind of leaves. It doesn't really clarify. Just something to think about. Um. So we'll just very quickly talk about foreshadowing. Yeah, there's a question on your sheet about this. Uh, foreshadowing is pointing to the future, basically. I mean, there's there's more complicated ways of saying it, but this is this is sufficient. So the land we will inherit the earth. You know, Israel got really uh, focused on you know the actual land of the you know the Palestinian area there. You know, um, in fact, people are still really focused on that. It's not about the land, people. That was just foreshadowing um, the future goodness that God will 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 give um, His children, because you know. Israel is going to be destroyed. You know that, right? The land of Israel, it's going to be gone with the rest of the earth. It's all going to be burned up by fire. But God is making, God is going to give us a land that can't pass away. The new heavens and the new earth. That's what it's pointing towards. You see what I mean? So that's foreshadowing the future blessing. Um, the law points to Christ. Shows us our weaknesses. Shows us how we need something outside of ourselves. Shows us how we are incapable. Have you ever tried reading through the books of the law and doing everything that it says? Good luck. We, you who are fallen, we salute you. It, it's not possible. And, and I, I mean, obviously, God knew that. Um, and we'll talk about that later if we ever talk about the purpose of the law. Um, so then the temple shows what Christ did. We don't, wor we're, we're worship, we don't worship at a place, do we? We worship in spirit and in truth, right? So it doesn't matter if we worship here or at the church or at you know, some temple. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we worship God in spirit and truth. See, that's what Jesus, the heart of what Jesus was saying to that Samaritan woman. You guys are fighting about whether to worship over there or over here, but there's something way bigger than you guys are talking about here. One day, my followers are going to worship me in spirit and truth. You know, he's talking about something way bigger, way bigger than they had going on. The king fulfilled in Jesus. So now that we've got all that, all that back stuff taken care of, we're at the question that I asked at the end of last week. If Jesus was a Jew, why is Judaism a cult? <sighs> you guys are so quiet. 
I was so excited for this lesson. You guys are being so quiet. I feel really awkward. <laughs> because they're not following the new testament. Uh, okay, but let me kind of challenge that to kind of make you um, keep delving. Um, the church didn't have the New Testament either. No, I mean, like, they don't believe Jesus was the Son of God. It's okay. Like he was just a good prophet. Okay. Person. Okay, there we go. There's a, there's a very, 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 very important point. They deny Jesus. Okay. Aren't they still waiting for a Savior? Like, don't they believe that... They're still waiting for the heavenly kingdom, yeah. I'm sorry, the earthly, earthly kingdom, yeah. yes. So they believe in works. Being yeah. By works. Yeah. Yeah, which we actually got going before Jesus even ever came. They start getting off on that rabbit trail. Right. So that they've been struggling over the whole salvation by grace for a long time. <laughs> so the earthly kingdom thing, it was just a misinterpretation? Yep. Just like it was a misinterpretation that Jews were the only people meant to be saved. See, the Bible says that from the beginning, God wanted all people to be saved. He wanted to bless all the nations to Abraham. But what Israel took from that is, we are blessed. We are the children of Abraham. So, we have superiority. You know what I mean? Kind of like um, Christians nowadays. I mean, the Holy Spirit's been promised to us, but you still have people denying the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Yeah. It's the same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, that's just something that I have a hard time believing, so I'm not going to believe it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, everybody does that. Yeah. It's, not like, it's not like I'm being down on the Jews. Everybody does this. So if Jesus was a Jew, why is Judaism a cult? Any other answers? I, good answers, by the way, those of you who answered. Okay. Jews looked forward to the Christ. All that was in the Old Testament always was looking forward and pointing forward to Christ. For instance, the psalm that's, that's quoted in Hebrews where he says, um, my Lord, sit at my Lord's feet while I establish your establish your kingdom. You know, obviously talking about Jesus and the Father and everything. Completely overlooked passages like that um, because they were looking. They they had their hearts set on this earthly kingdom going on. Um, so then, when Jesus finally came, they rejected him because they weren't actually looking for the Messiah anymore. They were looking for comfort. They were looking for things according to go according to their plans. See what I mean? And I say that with hesitancy because I mean. Honestly, how many of we, we've all been in that boat? God, you have to do things my way according to my plans. You know, I'm ex this is the way I'm expecting you to move, so you best do it this way. You know, what I mean, we've all been in that boat. And then when God doesn't respond in the way that we want, we get upset. See, what I mean, it's just that's just something we do, I guess. Um, so that takes us to John the Baptist. John the Baptist's point, purpose, I mean, was to proclaim the coming Christ. Was he a Jew? Yes. But the the Christ hadn't come yet. See? So his purpose was to declare the coming Christ. Shortly after Jesus came, okay, he, he had baptized him and everything, right? Then he's taken out of the picture and he, he dies. Before Jesus ever even fulfills his work. Jesus has not died yet and John the Baptist is killed. Why? Because there was no need for a, for a herald of something that was coming when it was already there. That's why Jesus says to the Pharisees, the kingdom is already among you. It's right here. It's me. I, here I am. You're looking for something. I'm right here. So, I mean, that's his, that was his point when he was saying there. Um, <clears throat> so then Jesus obviously was a Jew because he hadn't sacrificed himself yet. So Judaism was still established. See what I mean? Which takes us to what is Christianity? Christianity is Judaism. From the earliest of days, we were the same thing. What separated it us is that we believed in Christ. They rejected Christ. Right. Same foundation. They both used the Old Testament. They both believed in, in God. Just one put their faith in Jesus and one didn't. See what I mean? Think of two brothers. That, you know, One does the right thing and one does the wrong thing. It's the exact same thing. That's why um, there's not, there, there was... If you read through the different things, there's not such an easy distinction. For instance, when you get to the book of Romans, notice how, G how Paul puts a stronger separation between Jew and Gentile. But if you read an, uh, an older book like Galatians, there's not such a big divide between Jew and Gentile, is there? See what I mean? 
You see what I'm getting at here? Because the, the separation, it was slowly growing where people start, were starting to realize, ah, just because someone is a Jew doesn't mean that they, they, they're going to accept Jesus. See what I mean? And Paul actually got so frustrated in one of the cities that he just went out from the, from the, from the synagogue and went straight over to the Gentiles. <laughs> he said, fine, have it your way. I'm going over there. <laughs> so anyways, um, <clears throat> Jesus was to fulfill the promise of uh, so salvation could come to all and be fully realized. What was intended all along and in fact in exodus god says you know i'm i'm establishing you as a, as a as a holy nation you are my you are my prophethood that i can or priesthood that i can you know reach the other nations and they just like whoosh, over their head um so then god's plan was to save all people um and jews kind of just got this elitist mentality which is i i find this I think it's called tragic irony that then the Germans singled out the Jews. See what I mean? What the Jews had done to the rest of the world, the Germans had done to the Jews. See what I mean? It's it's tragic irony. What you wouldn't have expected to have happened, happened. It's very, very weird um, how that happened. Of all the people that could have been singled out, it was the ones who had the role of giving the law to others and held it for themselves. See what I mean? That's just very weird. Um, God revealed himself. Jews reject the Trinity and God's full revelation. They reject Jesus. They reject, um, well, now they reject the Holy Spirit as a person. Um, but um, they, they kind of see the Holy Spirit kind of, I don't want to say this too Loudly, I guess, but kind of like the Jehovah's Witness, see, the Holy Spirit kind of is just more of God's power, not so much as an actual person of the Trinity. Um, they have a really hard time seeing that just because God is one does not mean that he is three persons. See what I mean? So they kind of just reject that whole idea of the Trinity just like the Jehovah's Witness do. Um, and so, I mean, that kind of just summarizes uh, how they developed into a cult. See what I mean? They weren't expected to... Look, see, how could I ask this? We are expected to look back to Christ, but they were expected to look forward to Christ. But then when the Christ came, they were still looking forward instead of switching their gaze to behind. <laughs> see what I mean? <laughs> so, um, God wanted a people with a heart after him. Jews made it all about the law, all about doing the thing. It was all about perfection. It wasn't about the heart. And it's, one of you mentioned this. I think it was Gracie, right? Was it you, Grace? About not doing it from the heart? That was you, right? No? Well, one of you guys mentioned about the Jews making it all about the law and not about doing the things from the heart, whoever that was. And and that's that's really um, one of the key parts here is, is Jews, even nowadays, are still making it about the law. They're still going to the to the welling wall. See what I mean? Welling over something that, that, that ended 2,000 years ago. See what I mean? Still, still looking for something that already came 2,000 years ago. This is what happened. Jesus said, tear this, tear this temple down, in three days I'll rebuild it. He said, ha, <laughs> stupid. This was built, it took a, long, a lot of people a long time to build. That's not going to happen. He was killed, three days later he was raised from the dead. Then, 40 years after Jesus was killed, around 70 AD, um, the Romans came in and tore, pretty much tore down Jerusalem, and the temple was destroyed at that time. See what I mean? And as far as, to my knowledge, the temple was never rebuilt at any time between 70 AD and today, so that's where the welling wall is. It's it's still there, the the edge of that of that thing that's still there, but it's it's gone, you know. So, um, were there any questions about this? Because this was kind of a big, big thing, and I covered a lot of different territory. I tried to stay on focus. I really did, but there was just so much uh, to talk about. Any questions? No? We're good? Good. Awesome. So just to summarize in case that there were any 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 confusion, when Christianity got going, the Jews treasured the tradition of men over God's revelation. And the Christians were willing to submit to God's new direction. Once again, the promise didn't change. Okay, 
God just enriched it in different ways. The law, which wasn't even, okay, the law wasn't even from the start. It was much later given through Moses, okay? The promise was the thing that the Jews should have been looking at, but they were looking at the law. See, what was the law based on? The promise. See, I mean, it all pointed back to the promise. But they got their eyes so focused on the law, completely overlooked things. See, I mean, the law was just to, to enrich the promise, the same as the kingdom was meant to enrich the promise. Okay? But Jesus came and fulfilled that. And where there's a change of the priesthood, there is by necessity a change of the law. Uh, that You can read about that in Hebrews. Um, so, that takes us to the question of the week. Why do you think people are afraid of death or the end times? Or, why do you? Why are you afraid of death or the end times? Pick or choose, it doesn't matter. Um, if you don't want to answer out these, you can say, um, why do you think people are afraid of revelations? Uh, or, uh, why are you afraid of the book of revelations? Whatever. Um, yeah. And don't forget to keep um, keep Diana and Lauren and, and Zach in your prayers throughout the week. 